Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Tonight we observed Yom HaShavuah Agbura, uh, the day of Holocaust Memorial in our Jewish tradition. And we are um, gathered together in song as we sing from the Book of Psalms as Rabbi Chaikin has done. Uh, we'll recall special readings tonight and hear from uh, an incredible teacher, uh, Dr. Margaret Feinstein, who is a so a professor at Loyola Marymount University. Um, you're at, uh, we will um, have time for a Q&A with her as well, and also to memorialize uh, the 6 million Jews who perished during the Shoah. Uh, as we gather together, and we think about uh, our loved ones, our family members, uh, and those Jews that we didn't know. We think about uh, many others of other groups that were persecuted and murdered, but no single group more than our people, than the Jewish people. So we begin with silence, the silence of death, the silence after destruction. There are times when songs falter, when darkness fills life, when martyrdom becomes a constellation of faith against the unrelieved black of space about us. There are no words to reach beyond the edge of night, no messenger to tell the full tale. There is only silence, the silence of Job, the silence of the six million, the silence of memory. Let us remember them as we link our silence. And so at this moment, I'm going to invite um, as a participant, uh, our temple member and past president, Bill Weinberger. Bill is sharing a, a reading to us of Dr. Leo Beck, who was the head of the Berlin uh, Jewish community uh, during the war and then deported to Theresienstadt and really was the leader in Theresienstadt in the Czech Republic. Um, and then eventually after the war uh, came to the United States and was a teacher at uh, Hebrew Union College, our Reform Seminary, he had been a professor in Berlin, uh, and then uh, at the Jewish Seminary there at the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, which was the rabbinical seminary in uh, Berlin for uh, foreign Jews. Um, and then, uh, then uh, eventually Leo Beck became uh, the chairman of the World Union for Progressive Judaism. Um, Bill's reading and sharing with tonight as a Based as a child of survivor, his mother Eva of blessed memory who died just a couple of months ago um, was a refugee from Austria, from Vienna and 
uh, told Bill stories of remembering when the Nazis came to Austria uh, prior to uh, the war starting and uh, remember watching them come uh, in to Vienna from her balcony. And so um, I've invited Bill and later we'll hear from Hannah Klein also, grandchild of survivors and liberators uh, who will also participate tonight. So Bill, thank you for participating. Thank you, Rabbi. We would assemble in the darkness to light a candle there or even a match would have brought immediate disaster upon us. We spoke about matters of the spirit and eternal questions about God, about Jews in the world, about the eternity of Israel. In the midst of the darkness, I sensed a light in the unlit room, the light of Torah. Thank you. We kindle a light tonight in memory of the 6 million Jews murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators. May the memory of the righteous be for a blessing. Zichronam Libracha. Ashrei Hagarfur, Ashin Israf, the Hitzit Lavot, Ashrei Haleva, Shabar Av, the Sistre Lavavot, Ashrei Halev Novot, Shayat U Lahado Bokhavod, Ashrei Hagarfur, Shin Israf, the Hitzit Lahavot. Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. Blessed is the flame that burns in the secret fastness of the heart. Blessed is the heart with the strength to stop its beating for honor's sake. Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. Pay, we, we will offer now Anima Amin. If you're following along in Mishkan Tefillah, you can find the words on page 531. You can also hum along at home. Anima Amin are the words, I believe in perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, the coming of a better time. Despite it all, I will still believe. As Rabbi Eger mentioned, Hannah is the granddaughter of survivors and liberators. Um, and uh, in particular, we, she's remembering, we're remembering with her, uh, her grandmother, Sarah, uh, a survivor who died earlier this year. If worry and despondency seek our undoing, then we should think about Yizker in such a way that we carry on the work of our ancestors from Sinai in that we today are truly their children and in that we are parents of the future generations. Then the chain does not break and we gain the strength to carry out nobly these historical responsibilities and to thank God sincerely that Yisker has become the celebration of our soul. We'll sing together, Olam Chesed Ibane, a world of kindness will be built following along with that theme of hope 
that despite our grief, that despite our mourning, our legacy and the legacy of our loved ones and those whom we are the ones to remember can be a legacy of hope and kindness. Tonight, we are just so honored to be able to share um, and learn from a, an amazing teacher that's right here in our own midst here in Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Margaret Myers Feinstein received her PhD in history from the University of California at Davis. She is currently the clinical assistant professor in Jewish studies at Loyola Marymount University, where she teaches courses on modern Jewish history and the Holocaust. Interested in the legacies of Nazism, Feinstein's the author of State Symbols, The Quest for Legitimacy in the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic, 1949 to 1959, and Holocaust Survivors in Post-War Germany. Her publications are related to literature and representations of the Holocaust, include articles on theater in the displaced person camps, images of parenthood and Holocaust survivor narratives, and a reassessment of the Jewish rage in the works of Elie Wiesel. Feinstein's current book projects uses survivor narratives to investigate retribution against Germans after the Holocaust. This work has received the support of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Hadassah Brandeis Institute. I've known Margaret for many years. Uh, I'm so honored to finally be able to bring her to us at Kola Me. She's an incredible person an incredible teacher and um, also uh, someone who has so much compassion and love. Her talk tonight is going to be entitled When the Last Survivors Are Gone, The Future of Holocaust Memory and Memorialization. And there will be time for Q&A afterwards and you'll be able to put your questions or comments in the chat and we'll be able to do that. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Feinstein. Thank you so very much. Um, it's a real honor for me to be here and to commemorate Yom HaShoah with all of you. I um, especially uh, want to offer my condolences to Bill on the loss of your mother, Ava, and to Hannah on the loss of your grandmother, Sarah. Um, my grandparents were refugees from Nazi Germany. They were fortunate to get out in 1936, um, but they lost uh, members of their extended family. And so uh, this occasion is also uh, very significant for me personally. So I'm going to share my screen uh, with you. I have a, some slides, so you don't have to look at me the whole time <laughs> that I'm talking. Um, so unfortunately, you know, time marches on and we are reaching the time when uh, we will see the last survivor pass away. And 
survivors are so important to the way I teach about the Holocaust, the way I learn about the Holocaust, um, that I've had to start thinking about how do we transition to the time when the survivors are no longer here with us to share their stories. So I want to tell you a little bit about how Holocaust survivors help to shape Holocaust education. Um, here on this slide is uh, of a class of mine, a literature of the Holocaust class a couple of years ago, when I assigned the students memoirs written by survivors who live in Los Angeles. And at the end of the semester, the students, after reading the memoirs, thinking about them, reflecting on them, they wrote letters to the authors, to the survivors. We then invited the survivors to join us for a luncheon on campus. And this is, these are photos from that luncheon. You can just see everyone engaged in this. So in the front of the picture on the right is Dr. John Benfield, a survivor from uh, Vienna. Um, he's actually looking at a book, which is a memoir by another survivor who was there but is not in the picture, Zenon Newmark. I mentioned this because you may know some of these people. And then uh, a little towards the back on the left uh, in the red sweater and cap is uh, Gerda Seifert, another um, survivor who was with us. So one of the things that having them come to meet with the students does is it humanizes uh, the Holocaust. It provides a human face instead of numbers. Uh, numbers don't tell us anything. And in fact, as we unfortunately know from the too often uh, mass shootings in this country, that the numbers can be numbing. Um, I just realized that the word numb is inside of numbers. Oh, well, anyway. Um, so to be able to connect to an individual story, to an individual's experience, um, can make the learning that much more significant and memorable. Um, by creating these connections between students and survivors, um, it enables the students to feel empathy um, for the survivors, and then by extension to others who may uh, be undergoing persecution or um, survivors of other genocides. The survivors also provide an example of resilience, and you know, certainly we all can use those examples in this day of pandemic. Um, but survivors have also, prior to the pandemic, gone into uh, schools and organizations to speak to at-risk children. And uh, interviews with those children afterwards um, time and time again show that they are able to relate to the survivors because you know, the fear of death, the fear of senseless violence, uh, the questions of persecution resonate with them. And inevitably they say that it's reassuring to them. It gives them hope to be able to see the resilience of the survivors and to be able to now to imagine that they too could overcome their situation. Um, in another way, survivors help protect us against deniers of the Holocaust or distorters of the Holocaust. You know, when they're there, they can be there to say, no, that's not how it was. You have to listen to me, I'm going to tell you. And so when they are gone, we're going to lose those voices. And I'll tell you right now that the rest of my talk is going to be about how we can take up their voice, how we too can bear witness. And so some of the ways we can do that is by uh, taking up the traces that the survivors leave behind. Um, and that can be people like Hannah or Bill, right? Second and third generation as children and grandchildren of survivors who are um, going into schools, going into clubs and telling their ancestors story. Now they can't tell the story the way the survivor told the story. They're not going to be able to answer how did I feel when this happened, but they can provide other information that survivors sometimes leave out when they tell their stories. Um, oftentimes survivors think, well, all they wanna hear from me is about the Holocaust. And so that's all the story that they tell. 
but with the children and grandchildren, just by their presence, it lets the audience know that there was an after the Holocaust life for the survivors and that they created families and that uh, they left uh, this sort of legacy. And so second and third generation have a role to play. And some, as I said, have gone into schools to speak. Others have written novels or memoirs um, of their relationship with their survivor parent. Um, and those are uh, helpful for conveying some of the experience in a different way. We can also use the memoirs as I did in my class. You know, someday in the future, I won't be able to invite the survivors to come meet with the students, but the students can still meet them through their writing, through the memoirs. We also have wonderful access to oral history videos. Um, there's a Fortinoff archive in uh, Yale University. Uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC is also gathering uh, videotape testimonies, but perhaps the most well-known is here in Los Angeles, the USC Shoah Foundation archive. Uh, which has over 50,000 uh, testimonies uh, of survivors along with liberators and rescuers. As part of what the Shoah Foundation does, they've created a site called Eyewitness, uh, which is uh, set up for educators. And uh, I, as an educator, can set up an account and invite my students to join. And with Eyewitness, approximately, I think it's around 1,200 of the testimonies are made available uh, to teachers for use in the classroom, divided into segments. Um, if I wanted, I could search for um, food in the ghetto or something like that and get people talking about the situations in the ghetto revolving around food. And there are also, a, within that, uh, an instructor can build an activity for their students. I use ones that others have already built, uh, which will teach about a particular issue using videotapes, testimony segments from various survivors, providing maps and other things, and then with questions for reflection. Uh, one of the things I love in one of the activities is they get to build a word cloud using the words that they heard in the testimonies. Um, and so it, and my students, always come back from that feeling that they understand better what happened than what they could get from a history book. So they feel that connection even through video and perhaps maybe with the younger generation, I mean, they've grown up in such a digitized video world. Um, it might even connect with them more than it does for someone of my generation. One other thing that the Shoah Foundation is doing is called Dimensions in Testimony. They are creating holograms. Uh, when I first heard about this, I was um, concerned, right? Concerned that they were you know, creating some kind of fake interaction. Um, but I've since learned more. And in fact, if anyone's interested, there was a 60 minute segment um, about this that is available I think it's on YouTube, but anyway, you can Google it and find it, um, Dimensions and Testimony. And it turns out that they've interviewed particular survivors with this in mind. And so the survivors go into this knowing that that's what this is for. And it's not a composite of survivors, it's that individual survivor um, that you would hear from. And so this is a photo of one of the survivors who participates uh, in uh, Dimensions and Testimony. Um, his name is Pinchas Gutter. And, um, and so what I can do, I mean, if I were in the room with the hologram, is I could ask him something about uh, his childhood. And through the magic of technology, they'll go to that part of his testimony that they've recorded, and he'll respond about his childhood. And um, seeing the 60 Minutes episode where I was able to see it in action, uh, it was really uh, very moving and I think will be very effective um, for, it's not the same as being with a living survivor, but um, you know, it's pretty, uh, still pretty remarkable a way, I think, to convey the information and the humanity of survivors. Um, other ways are through literature. Uh, there is a lot of literature written by 
uh, survivors that have been left behind. Uh, there's literature being written by children of survivors. A mouse is by a child of a survivor. Uh, they were like family to me. So just the ones here are also by child survivor. But you also have people who do not have a direct connection to the Holocaust, such as um, Davi Grossman, who is Israeli, an Israeli author. His parents were um, Israelis and so uh, were not uh, caught up in the Holocaust. And yet he writes about um, the legacy of the Holocaust for the next generation in his book, See Under Love. Um, so literature is a way to, again, connect with uh, the stories, um, to make them come alive, to engage someone's compassion and empathy. Um, it also, I think, can help speak to newer generations. For example, they were like family to me, uses some magic realism to tell the stories the author is a child of survivors and she's telling her mother's stories, but using magic realism. So for example, there's a golem that appears in one of the stories, there's a talking dog. Um, so obviously these are not real and yet ultimately the stories are based on fact. And um, my students really respond to this. Uh, and I think it's because magic realism is something they're familiar with and it's a way, an entryway into the story um, and so it still deals with uh, horrifying things and heartbreaking things, um, but it's different. And as I said, it speaks to another generation. Um, art is also uh, a way to uh, introduce people to the subject and to look at it. Um, I meant to have a piece of art by Samuel Bach. He was a child survivor who uh, became recognized for his art while he was still in a displaced persons camp after the war. He won a scholarship to France um, to study, but I, I couldn't find one that really fit. But anyway, but so here we have uh, the IG Farben painting is by an American uh, artist who wanted to expose the, the real people who were behind uh, the Holocaust, that it wasn't demons, but ordinary businessmen here, the leaders of IG Farben. Um, and then on the other side, uh, this is a, a piece of art by a Polish non-Jew who survived Auschwitz, um, who very late in life felt compelled to draw his Auschwitz experience. Uh, his artwork is called The Labyrinth, and it's in a basement of a church not too far from Birkenau. And uh, he pays tribute to a number of the Jewish inmates of Auschwitz with whom he was imprisoned um, in this piece of art and in a few other pieces of art as well. Um, and, uh, and so it can be very uh, moving and powerful. Also having students create their own art after they've had a chance to learn about uh, the Holocaust can be a very, um, cathartic experience for students, but also um, helps to connect them even more closely to the material. And now I'm, I'm going to talk about something really extraordinary, I think, that the Jewish Studies program at Loyola Marymount does. Um, every other year, we take a class to um, Poland, and we start in some non-Polish place, then go to Poland. So uh, the year that I went, we started in Berlin. Um, this last year, we were supposed to have gone last year, uh, but of course the pandemic uh, nixed that. And we'd actually planned to simply go to Poland, spend the entire time in Poland. Um, but what's important, I think, whenever uh, studying about the Holocaust or even going on this kind of educational travel is to not just focus on the persecution and the death, but to focus on the richness of Jewish life prior to the Holocaust, um, which both humanizes the Jewish people um, who then become victims and survivors, um, and also um, puts the Holocaust into a larger context and so that students can come to appreciate the richness of the life that had existed and make it even more significant that those lives were lost. 
So I just want to share some of the things that we did when we uh, when I took the class on this trip. Um, we started in Berlin and we did a walking tour where I took them to important sites of uh, Jewish history in Berlin, um, some going back to the um, 14th century so that they could understand and appreciate that uh, Jews had been in Germany in, in some places even longer than the Germans had settled in Germany and uh, wanted them to see this and understand it. And then we also went to see the ways in which uh, Germans are attempting to memorialize uh, what happened. And uh, this is a place that I find um, very meaningful, the Otto Weidt Workshop for the Blind. Otto Weidt was not Jewish, um, but in order to help blind Jews, blind and deaf Jews survive, uh, he gave them jobs in his broom and brush factory so that they would be considered, um, I can forget the term, but worthwhile workers, valuable workers for the war effort. Um, and when Jews started being deported from Berlin, uh, he worked to find hiding places for his employees. And, and some of them indeed uh, were able to survive um, the war. And I think it's important, even though rescuers were all too few, shamefully few, not only in Germany, but in other countries. I do think it's important for me to teach my students about that because ultimately I want my students to think about if they are bystanders to an injustice, how are they going to respond? How are they going to help those who are being persecuted? And I see these people like Otto Weidt as role models. Another way that, oh, and that was a museum now. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. The Autobite Workshop is now a museum. Um, in the Bavarian Quarter, which had, had a large uh, Jewish population um, in the 1930s, uh, artists have installed signs on lampposts. And on this one, see if my cursor works, you can see here, there is a picture of a cake. And there were other signs, other places, you know, like of a dog, uh, because Jews at one point were no longer allowed to have pets. So on the back of the sign, it will explain that Jews were forbidden to have pets and give the date of the ordinance. Um, here, this one is about bakers. And so this is the backside. I'm sorry, it's out of focus, um, but it essentially says that bakers are prohibited from selling cake to Jews and Poles. And it gives the date, February 1942. So um, this is a way in which you know, Germans are trying to, or at least some German artists are trying to help people remember the everyday indignities that on the, in and of themselves don't seem so terrible and yet pave the way for a mass extermination and the Holocaust. As one um, historian, Marion Kaplan writes, uh, she calls this social death, that German Jews were, were socially dead before they were deported and then physically murdered. Also in the Bavarian Quarter, but now you can find it in cities throughout Germany, also in Austria, really throughout Europe now, um, are the Stolpersteine, stumbling stones. Um, these stumbling stones uh, mark the locations where Jews and others were arrested and deported. And uh, they have on them the name of the person, uh, their birth date or birth year, uh, the year that they were deported, and then the information about what happened to them. So on these, uh, it's, it says that they were murdered in Auschwitz. And um, and I've been witness to people who see them for the first time, you know, who have been walking back and forth, not noticing them. And because my students and I have stopped to look, they suddenly stop and they realize what they are. And it gives them a whole new perspective on their neighborhood. Um, this is now a memorial site in uh, the Berlin city section of Grunewald. The Berlin Grunewald station on track 17 uh, had a lot of trains that left from there to the east, deporting Berlin Jews. And so it's now memorial. You can see people have left yard site candles there. 
Um, this is a close up along the track. It has, and there are multiple of these, one for each of the transports that left from the station. It gives the date, the number of Jews, and their destination. And this one happens to be um, from Berlin to Theresienstadt, which, as Rabbi Eger mentioned, is where uh, Rabbi Leo Beck uh, was sent and served the community there. From Berlin, we went to Poland. And in Poland, our theme was the vanished landscape. It was talking about what had been there and what's been lost and what is no longer there. Finding absences, you know, the finding the, the marks in the uh, doorway that were where the mezuzah used to be. Um, finding those things and, and making the students aware of them. Um, this is a, a lovely little sort of artist colony town in Poland. Uh, the ruins you see here are of a castle that uh, was purportedly built uh, for one of the former king's Jewish mistress. So uh, again, part of the you know, Jews and Poles had lived together in, in ways we don't necessarily think of these days. Uh, we spend most of our time in Krakow. Uh, and uh, in Krakow, the uh, Jewish synagogues, many of them have been restored and turned into uh, museums. Uh, there is one that's being used by Chabad. The um, Jewish Community Center is where the, um, well, it's would be modern Orthodox service takes place. Um, this uh, reform congregation uh, no longer meets, but it's being used as a museum around the, um, when I was there, around the sides, around the walls, there were photographs um, documenting the creation of the Krakow ghetto under the Nazi occupation. Um, one of the things we had students do while we were in Krakow is we paired with a class of Polish students um, from the local university and divided them into groups where LMU students and Polish students together uh, went to different memorial sites and had to do research about them. So one of the memorial sites was uh, of this ghetto and there, this is a, um, a memorial at the site of the, of the um, former pharmacy uh, where the uh, pharmacist was not Jewish and he was the only non-Jew permitted to maintain his business at the time. And he was involved with the underground and uh, actually people escaping from the Warsaw ghetto, some of them would come to him and he would have uh, peroxide or some other bleach that they could bleach their hair or dye their hair so that it make it easier for them to escape uh, going through the gates as if they were a Polish worker leaving or something like that. So, um, so students did research on this. I went with a group of students to the site of the Plaszow concentration camp. Those of you who have seen Schindler's List uh, will know this location. Um, that's the concentration camp that everyone's in where um, Amon goes around shooting all the Jews. Um, it's now essentially a, a park. Uh, it's open air space. And so people jog through here. Uh, there is someone and no one I spoke to could tell me who, but someone is still plowing and maintaining that square that you see, which was where the Appel plots, where the roll call took place in the concentration camp. So clearly there's someone who's still making it clear that this site is not just, you know, a, free time fun place, but that it has had another past to it. Um, it led to some very interesting discussions between the LMU students and the Polish students. The LMU students were sort of horrified at how um, for them it was uh, sacrilegious, uh, the way in which the land was being treated. Whereas for the Polish students, they were like, Everywhere we look in this country, there are dead bodies from different wars and different things. And so we can't commemorate every site or we'll have nothing left for the living. Um, it was a very interesting, uh, eye-opening conversation, I think, for all of us. Um, Auschwitz-Birkenau is the closest death camp to Krakow. So we did go there to visit. Um, my first time there was in 1990. 
Uh, so there were not that many Western tourists there at the time. And you could just go in and wander around, uh, which I did. And I mean, there was, a, there was a little tour group that came through at one point, but really it was very, um, not, not much there uh, other than the maintained barracks and things. Uh, Birkenau was not even open for anyone to see. And uh, it was clear that Auschwitz, it was primarily to commemorate the Polish communists who had died there. There was very little about the Jews there. When I went back with this class in 2018, 2017, uh, it was vastly different. I mean, when I had been there in 1990, you walk out the gate and there was a guy who had set up his little ice cream cart right there in this little entryway kind of thing, which horrified me. Um, but now yeah, that's been made into this huge plaza and there is a separate building for a bookstore and souvenir shop. And there is a huge parking lot for all the tour buses. And there are huge masses of people with all the different tours. And it was there that I saw that treating Holocaust as a tour has its, has its problems. It was problematic. And we've seen in the news, uh, you know, people talking about, you know, is it appropriate to take a selfie at Auschwitz? because people have done that smiling. And, and, and while I understand the desire to see yourself at the place, it, it does seem to me that you know, inappropriate in many ways. And so I do caution uh, when doing this, that, that Auschwitz not just be something you check off on your list, you know, along with going to the Louvre or you know, some other site. And that's why I think our class is done so well is because it's, um, contextualized uh, in a way that uh, makes it uh, something um, more essential, uh, more real. Um, at the end of our tour, uh, we had a tour guide. Uh, it's really the best way now to go through Auschwitz. Um, we went to, there's an Israel uh, national exhibition. Uh, every country that had people die in Auschwitz has have a little exhibition. And uh, at the end of the Israeli exhibition is this book of names. And you can see how long this book is. And it's Yad Vashem's list of all of the names of Jewish victims of the Holocaust. And we had students here who were looking so one of the students is named Khan. So she was looking for, and took this picture of all of the Khans on the page. Um, we had another student who was looking for his family name and actually found someone who died, who had his own name, his first and last names. And that was very um, traumatic for him actually. Uh, and for the non-Jewish students being there, I mean, at this point we, they had, created bonds with one another already um, to see the pain in their classmates as they found their family name or even their own name uh, on the list was very profound. We then went to, uh, moved on to Warsaw and in Warsaw, um, there's a relatively new museum, Pauline, uh, Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And it, I really say, have to say, I think it's a fabulous uh, museum. It does an excellent job of portraying the long history of Jews in Poland. Um, there's even a reconstructed um, synagogue uh, from a traditional Polish wooden synagogue inside. Um, lots of interactive things. So it's very sophisticated as far as, you know, the latest uh, technology for museums. Um, but again, it helps to contextualize things that when you get to the Holocaust, you already have this understanding of a longer Jewish tradition. Um, and then one of the places I thought was very effective is they've recreated a street from like the 1920s, the street in Warsaw, and there's um, a little Jewish cinema and you can go in and watch um, the Dybbuk and other silent movies and early talkies. Uh, uh, from the Yiddish theater. Um, so, uh, and then of course, and then as you get to the Holocaust, 
things narrow and twist. I mean, so you get this feeling of oppression that comes in. And across from the museum uh, is the memorial for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising because these are built on the locations of the former ghetto. Um, so again, their very location um, connects those sites um, to the Holocaust. The other thing that the students uh, will see when we're in uh, Warsaw is they go to the local reform congregation for services um, because we want them to end with a sense that uh, there is a renewal of Jewish life in Poland that it's not all death, um, that Jews have continued to be Jewish, to embrace their culture and their heritage. Um, and so uh, that we do at Warsaw before we return to LA. So just to summarize ways in which we can become witnesses, we can learn the survivor's stories. Right? We can read their memoirs. We can go to eyewitness or uh, through many libraries, you can gain access to the full Shoah Foundation um, visual history archive. You can watch the testimonies. Listen to second and third generation presentations about the Holocaust experience of uh, their four parent. Develop empathy, both within ourselves, but encourage the growth of empathy among others through literature, through art, educational travel. As I said, you know, there are some pitfalls uh, potentially, but I think it can also be very rewarding and enriching. And, you know, with visits to museums, to memorials, to the sites of life, as well as sites of persecution. And then we can become witnesses and keep others honest, you know, speak out if uh, the Holocaust is treated in a disrespectful fashion in some pop culture uh, venue. Um, you know, keep our um, opinion makers and policy makers um, honest and respectful of the truth of what happened in the Holocaust um, and in the lessons that we can take from it. So thank you for your attention. That, um, thank you. That's what thank I had to you, say. Margaret, uh, Dr. Feinstein, thank you so much. Um, uh, really uh, lots to think about. Um, I already have a few questions, private message to me. So I'll start by asking Karen Shanbrom to unmute and ask her question. Thank you, Max. Um, hello, Margaret, nice to see you. Good to see you, Karen. <laughs> Margaret and I have history. Um, thank you for spending the evening uh, uh, in this incredible presentation. Um, I had actually posed a question in the chat to Max before you answered it, um, <clears throat> but uh, it seems perhaps you could elaborate a little bit. And specifically, I, I grew up being told and learning and hearing so much that the Jewish community in Poland was all but non-existent. And the likelihood of a Jewish community in Poland um, rising from the ashes, I guess literally and figuratively, uh, was minimal. And I was going to ask, what is the status now of, of the Jewish population in Poland? You, you, you talked about that a little bit, but I wonder if you could elaborate on that, including um, how, not just numbers or anything like that, but how did it, how did it grow? How did this, how, how did it turn about? Thank you. So I'm, I wish I had, I don't have the statistics at my fingertips, so I'm sorry I won't be able to give you numbers right now. But um, I mean, that was definitely true, that the Jewish community was, um, 
well, very few left, I mean, were, excuse me, very few remained in Poland after the war. Those who had managed to survive, um, some had survived in the Soviet Union in exile. Um, others had survived in hiding or were some of the survivors from the concentration camps. Um, there were pogroms after the war uh, in Poland. And so a number of those Jews left uh, once they recognized that their families were gone uh, their communities were decimated um, and that their lives were imperiled. So once all of those people had left, there were maybe 50,000 Jews who remained in Poland. Many of them uh, well, were too sick to start over somewhere else or you know, did not want to start over somewhere else. Um, you also had some who were Bundists or communists who wanted to partake in the building of a socialist society in Poland. Um, Marek Edelman is one of the more famous ones. Uh, he was uh, one of the fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto, um, who then, once Stalinism really started to crack down on things, decided that this was not what he had intended to sign up for. So, uh, but he remained in Poland. Um, but we had, there were a number of people who had survived um, as hidden children who didn't know that they were Jewish. Um, mm -hmm. But then when their adoptive family, or adoptive parent or grandparent uh, was on their deathbed, suddenly confessed, you're actually a Jew. And so when communism fell in 1990, there was actually a small group of people and it's sort of grown over time who were, had newly discovered that they had Jewish roots and were interested in exploring that. And a number have um, converted or affirmed uh, their Judaism. But when I attended the, um, uh, the Modern Orthodox uh, Community Center say, uh, service, uh, Shabbat service in uh, Krakow, uh, there were a lot of expatriates there, you know, so Brits um, who had settled in the area who were or had retired, decided to retire uh, for various financial reasons and uh, cultural reasons, um, made up a lot of the congregation there. Um, so uh, the service was actually in Hebrew and English. <laughs> so, um, and I know that the Reform Congregation in Warsaw, for example, uh, is uh, heavily funded by uh, survivors who are now in America, but who want to um, see the restoration of Judaism in Poland, but of a reformed nature. Um, but you also have Chabad going, going into a number of these places. And you have some people who think that Chabad is more authentic because that's their pic picture of Jews is the picture of the Jews in the Hasidic outfit and uh, really based more, I think, on stereotypes than on a true appreciation for what it means, but Chabad is happy to take them anyway. Um, so I don't, I don't think I would call this a real groundswell of discovery of Jewish community and roots, um, but there are some. And what we also see is there are a lot of young people who maybe, um, you know, don't see themselves as Jews, but are very fascinated by Yiddish culture and klezmer music. And so uh, Krakow every summer, I think it's every June, has this huge festival where not many Jews are there. It's mostly non-Jews, but they have klezmer bands and just all kinds of stuff going on. Um, and it's really interesting. So you're, we're seeing, the, at least among some of the Polish population, uh, a d desire to see you know, what they're now missing, you know, trying to find that missing piece of Pol Polish heritage that the Jews had been part of. Great, thank you very much, Margaret. Sure. Uh, Bill also had a question uh, that directed to me privately. I'll, let, I'll ask you to answer that, ask that yourself there, Bill. Okay, thanks Rabbi. Um, thank you, for, and thank you for your talk. Um, so is there a group or are there groups that focus on responding to and neutralizing disinformation campaigns of Holocaust deniers? And also are there groups, maybe it's the same groups, that um, try to educate people who are susceptible to online messages from neo-Nazi groups or alt-right groups that have adopted Nazi symbolism and slogans? 
Uh, the ADL has an excellent website uh, for uh, helping you to identify what are the, some of the slogans. I've learned a tremendous amount there. Um, so, you know, they'll have the latest emojis and hand signs and things. They'll also let you know when things are maybe overblown and aren't really necessarily white supremacist or anti-Semitic. Um, so that's definitely an, organi an organization that's helping with that. Um, there is also, I'm blanking on its name. There, there is an organization that fights more on anti-Semitism than, than necessarily Holocaust denial. Um, I teach a course on the history of anti-Semitism at LMU, and I have the students do um, a, a social media project where after they've had a chance to learn about some of the main tropes of anti-Semitism and the types of anti-Semitic images that have been used over the centuries and in different cultures, um, I give them, they're broken into pairs, and each pair is given a, um, a tweet, an anti-Semitic tweet of relatively recent vintage that they then have to analyze and explain and contextualize. And, um, and so that's been very useful for teaching the students how to identify things that are anti-Semitic. And each time I have that assignment, students will tell me that they are now seeing things in social media that they had not noticed before because they didn't know what it meant and they now are that much more aware. And so they're helping um, to educate others, their friends. Um, in terms of organizations, I can't, I honestly can't think of anything major. I know that there are small scholar groups that are working on things. Um, um, but I will, you know what I will do? Because I do, I think that's really important, and I feel bad that I'm just blanking. I'm going to um, go to my things and find this, and afterwards I'll send it to Rabbi Eger, and maybe she can make it available to people who are interested. Absolutely, I, maybe Margaret should come back and have us do that lesson uh, about uh, teaching us how to identify what. Maybe I'll invite you back, and you'll teach us. Uh, I'd be delighted to come back. We could all, we could all be uh, those people who help on social media uh, with identifying, because I'm not sure we all know all the tropes and all the messages uh, that are there. Uh, we do have a really, actually, two people asked the same question. Uh, Belinda and Veronica both asked, how can they take part in the trips that you described and or the tours if they're not part of your class? Is there ever opportunity to travel with you uh, to any of those once COVID is uh, over? Well, we do, um, sometimes uh, we do have uh, members of the wider community uh, come on the trips with us. Um, so uh, that is a, a possibility. I'm trying to think of how we add, because we don't really advertise that. It's sort of, but now that you know, <laughs> you could contact the Jewish Studies Program at LMU and just say, please put me on the list, I'm interested. Um, I don't know, maybe sometime in the future, if enough people got together, I could do my own tour and not with LMU, but haven't done that yet. You know, we, we went in summer of 2019, a group of us from Kolomi, uh, we went and, and did uh, Warsaw, Krakow, uh, and then Budapest, and of course made the pilgrimage to Auschwitz and many of the places that, that you mentioned and a few others. And some of us went early to visit our grandparents and great grandparents villages just before. Um, it was a really powerful experience for all of us. Larry, who's Levi, who's uh, on this uh, class tonight also was there um, uh, uh, on that trip. And I have to say it was a very, very powerful, as you describe, experience. And we also met with members of uh, the Reform Synagogue in uh, one of the Reform Synagogues, Eitz Chaim in, the, in Warsaw and had dinner with some of their leadership. And it does, Give you a different perspective, the same in Budapest, you met with people there, um, gives you a different perspective to see uh, how, how uh, the Jewish community is trying to renew itself. We had Shabbat dinner at the Krakow JCC. I saw Sue Igloff was there on a different one. She, uh, she uh, ha uh, had it also experienced at the Krakow JCC. So uh, as you say, this is just so important for us to, to really assimilate what happened and to become the bearers of the stories and bearers of the tales even if we aren't direct descendants of those who were in the camps or 
uh, who were uh, murdered by other collaborators. And so I thank you for tonight, for, for teaching us, for enlightening us about how we can begin to make sure to honor the memories of those um, who did survive and those who died uh, and their stories uh, as, the, as we see tonight with Hannah's grandmother, a survivor, and now passed away, Bill's mother, who uh, just recently died in these past uh, months. And so uh, we become the bearers of that. So thank you so much, Dr. Feinstein, for, for teaching us and for being with us tonight and um, appreciate the opportunity to learn from you. Um, you. We're going to continue and conclude our ceremony tonight with the chanting of the El Mali Rachamin prayer, the prayer of memorial and then the opportunity to recite Kaddish, not only in memory of uh, any of our loved ones that we're remembering, but of course, in memory of those who perished during the show up. Uh, if you're following along in the prayer book, it's page 530. <laughs> Vemalot Kedoshim Turim, Kezohar Araki Amazirim, Et Nishmot Shisha Million Achenu Vachyotenu, Shenergu Alkidu Shashem. Bal Harachamim. Yastirem veseter knafa veolamim veitzror vitzror achaim et nishmatam Adonai hu nachalatam vayanu hu b'shalom al mishkavam v'nomar amen. Holy, compassionate God on high, to our six million brothers and sisters murdered because they were Jews, grant clear and certain rest with you in the lofty heights of the sacred and pure, whose brightness shine like the very glow of heaven. Source of all mercy, forever enfold them in the embrace of your wings and secure their souls in eternity. Adonai, they are now yours. They shall rest in peace. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Uh, on page 532 is the mourner's Kaddish. Um, and uh, if you are reciting Kaddish for someone, uh, Rabbi Chaikin, can we open the we microphones? Can. If we people would like to say a name aloud at this time, um, we'll allow you to do so if you'd like to do so at this time. May the memory of all of our loved ones, especially those who perished during the Shoah, uh, be with us as we tie our lives to theirs and their memory to ours. Amen. It barach pish tabach vit pa arvi pro mom vit nasse. It a darvi to levi to lao shame du kudusha brihu. The elaming ko beer katava shirata, tushba katava nechamata, dami ran vi alma vi imru ame. Hey shlomo rabba, mean shamaya vachayim, maleno vi al ko yisrael, vi imru ame, o se shalom vi romav, hu ya a se shalom, maleno vi al ko yisrael, va ko yisve tevel, vi imru ame. May the one who teaches us peace in the heavens above help us to make peace here on earth with one another and grant eternal peace to not only our loved ones who have died, but to the six million. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Um, as we conclude our ceremony tonight, again, to thank you to Dr. Feinstein for being with us and to all of you. We are counting the Omer, the period of days between Passover and Shavuot. So tonight we count the Omer uh, together. Hineni muhanu mazuman lekayem mitzvah to say shel sfirata Omer. I'm ready to fulfill the mitzvah of counting the Omer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech kolam. 
Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Al Spirata Omer. Praise to you, Adonai, sovereign of all, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to count the Omer. Hayom Yom Echad Asar Shehem, Hayom Yom Echad Asar Shehem Shavu Echad V'arba'a Yamim La'Omer. It is 11 days of the counting of the Omer, which is one week and four days of the Omer period. Uh, so we thank you all for being with us tonight. We're going to close our ceremony as we sing together, Ose Shalom. Uh, and to remind you that uh, well, services are Friday night at 6.30. Uh, Saturday at 11 is Family Shabbat. If you want to have spend a family, a half an hour of music and song and celebrating Yom Ha'atzma'ut with uh, our kids and families, uh, you can do that. Um, <coughs> events are on kol-ami.org. You can register in the calendar section for them. Um, and next Tuesday at 5.30, Chef uh, Jake Cohn, uh, author of the new cookbook, Jew-ish, is going to help us celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ut and help us uh, prepare some Israeli recipes. So um, hopefully uh, a way to help us move forward um, and, and build Jewish life together. So let us conclude with Oseh Shalom. Rabbi Jacob. This is a melody. It's one of Debbie Friedman's melodies. It's one of my favorites, but we don't sing it all that often. And for me, it is a melody that moves into hope. And so if you'd like to sing along with words or yellow lies, I just encourage you to mute uh, and add your voice to mine. Oh, say shalom. Thank you, friends, for being with us. And thank you again uh, for Hannah and Bill for also keeping your grandmother, your mother's memory alive by your participation tonight. I know uh, I appreciate your participation and always uh, to my uh, partner and friend, Rabbi Chaikin, for his leadership and, and heart. And we're so glad. Again, thank you again, Dr. Feinstein, and to all of you. We we'll wish you an Arab Tov. A good evening. Thank you. Thank you all.